Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, a podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Brew, and we are continuing our conversation about the life of Abraham. Last week, we talked about the sociology of dominion and the different ways that religion and culture can relate and interact. And this week, we are continuing on to one of Kierkegaard's favorite topics, the sacrifice of Isaac. Um, and I was, it's been a long time since I read Kierkegaard. I have read him, but I was kind of brushing up on it and looked over the spark notes. Um, <laughs> and the spark note summary was not at all as good as your summary, Greg. So why don't you go ahead and, well, maybe we don't even want to start with Kierkegaard. I don't know. Where would you like to begin? How about with a bumper sticker? It's kind of popular in my neck of the woods. It says something like, God is too great to be contained in any one religion. Mm. And at first glance to some people, that sounds really cool. Yeah, God is so big. God is so great. God is greater than, than anything anyone can conceive of. How could any one religion claim to have a corner on God? And God disappears in a poof of logic, to borrow a line. <laughs> or illogic as the case may be. The human heart and its search for would-be autonomy is torn between rationalism and irrationalism. Or to put it differently, it is irrationalistic and rationalistic at the same time. And, and so it is one thing to reduce God to a manageable size, but it's also fun to puff God up beyond our reason to such a point that he doesn't count anymore. He's so great. I can't talk about him. You can't talk about him. Hey, he can't even talk about himself. Because we're too puny to understand. We're too puny to understand. And so we've just locked God out of his own universe by emphasizing his supposed transcendence. And, and we can think here of Arius. I have a half a quote from him. I wish I'd brought the rest. God himself, as he really is, is inexpressible or ineffable to all. God is ineffable to the Son, for he is what he is to himself that is ineffable or indescribable. Because the infinite is so far transcends the finite, even if the finite be the adopted Son of God, which is what Arius took Jesus to be, the infinite cannot explain himself, itself, to the Son, and so God is wordless and... The son can just, with us, take his best guess at what in the world God might be. And that's what Arius left the world with. In his rationalism, trying to make sense of the Trinity, he created an irrationalist God and, and left us to make it up on our own. Oh, wow, I get to decide what's right and wrong. Wait, that sounds familiar <laughs> from some place. Mm. In, the, in the late 19th century, on into the 20th, we have existentialism which does this, and of course the existentialists protest that ours is not a system of thought, we abhor systems, <laughs> unless you're maybe Jean-Paul Sartre, he kind of was willing to take the label. Nobody else is. How do you, how do you recognize an existentialist? He refuses to be called one. <laughs> but the, the idea since Kierkegaard has been that whatever God is, he cannot be boxed in. He cannot be constrained within the limits of our creeds and confessions or within the limits of his own word. And if we are to have some kind of relationship with him, it must be with the full recognition that that's the way it is. Hmm. Uh, we, are, we are going to relate to God, but don't ask me how, what that means. Do not expect to hold God to any of his sayings, promises, or commitments, because he's just too big for all of that. But if you're willing to take God on those terms, welcome to meaning and truth. Yay. Yay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's tempting to say, okay, we're done, but we can't quite be done because this is where a lot of, of the world is today when it has any kind of religious bent. And unfortunately, particularly a Christian bent, although probably the average evangelical has not heard or has not heard the name Kierkegaard, that may be a passing and couldn't sum up any of his writings. Yet Kierkegaard's influence through uh, Karl Barth, uh, uh, secular existentialist Jaspers and Heidegger and Sartre, has been decisive. We are used to feeling after God, experiencing God, 
experiencing the ultimate high, Jesus Christ. That was my generation slogan. <laughs> Trip out with Jesus was another one. Jesus is better than Hashish was another one. Because when God can't be defined, then all we're left with is our gut feeling or our spiritual high. And um, what do we do with that? Well, we all agree that we've had a great feeling and we get together and uh, celebrate our um, great feeling this, I guess. Kierkegaard takes his uh, textual point of departure, which you said earlier, to be, I think, to be the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. He says this, this is the story, the, the, the faith of Abraham amazes him because, well, let's just consider what the Bible actually says. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abram, which tested him, and said unto him, Abraham, he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Now, take now thy son. Yeah, got, got that. That only son. Yes. Isaac, right. Whom thou lovest. Sure do. And get thee to the land of Moriah. Okay, you know where that is. And offer him up there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Hold up. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Now, the Say word, yeah, <laughs> word burnt offering, Ola, is um, an ascension offering, but traditionally ascension offerings were killed and burned in total. And that's no doubt how exactly how Abraham would take it. And, and God has gone out of his way to specify, I mean, there's another son, maybe it's Ish, no, you're, you're only one, the one who you love. It's <laughs> Isaac, I, Isaac, are we, are we clear here? Take him and sacrifice him on a mountain in the land of Moriah. Uh, you know, if you ever, if there was ever a great morning to sleep in, you would think it would be the next morning. But Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abram said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and, and come again to you. And Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they were both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him upon the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Obviously, Abraham took it to mean that God wanted Abraham to kill Isaac. And Kierkegaard looked at this and said, well, that's just absolutely incredible because this is the child of the promise. And uh, everyone knows that child sacrifice is wrong and that fathers ought to love their children, not go around sacrificing them and such. All of the moral logic of his culture of, and of Hebrew culture to that point went dead against what God was saying. And yet Abram, oh, and, 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 and chief here, again, back to this, the child of the promise, the hope of the world, the ancestor of Messiah. But, um, wow, isn't it amazing that Abraham was willing to toss all of that and go kill Isaac just because God said so? Give it all up because, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, that's what God said. And um, God being beyond all rational categories of thought and phenomenal categories of description, um Okay, well, didn't see this one coming, but when you play with an irrational God, things like this happen. And if you love God and you're going to trust him, you're going to do what he says without any hope that the thing you give up will ever come back to you. Mm. Now, in the light of what actually does happen, and, and out of a personal agenda, Kierkegaard smuggles something else in. He himself had given up something once upon a time, a young lady named Regina, who he'd had... Um, a romantic relationship with an engagement, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And he had given her up, perhaps not exactly in proper form. Jilted yeah, at the altar. <laughs> Ooh, worse than I knew. Uh, and he um, 
he always talks about it as him giving her. Did he kill her or did she kill him? I believe he did not show up to the wedding. It might not have been that dramatic, but I do believe that he... He was um, the one, right. Yeah, yeah. And and he he struggled with that because he felt kind of guilty, as the schmuck should have, (laughs) and and, and looked at it as, well, I gave it up in the greater... I gave her up in the greater service of God, and I, I gave her up completely. I mean, I didn't expect to get her back. I don't exactly expect her to, to get her back even now. But Abraham got Isaac back. But he had to completely abandon him first. He had to say, he's gone. He's dead. I'm not getting him back. He gave up on the promises to keep on walking with God. Oh, what? but look, he didn't have to kill him after all. And the boy's alive. Isn't that just great? Maybe there's hope for me somehow, some way, sometime. This is just a theologicalized philosopher's version of if you love it, let it go. And if it's meant to happen, it'll return to you. <laughs> okay, this is another point where I think we just say we're done here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think anyone's punctured Kierkegaard quite so well, Brian. <laughs> oh, well, a little more background is my... Uh, Vague memories of philosophy will hold up and feel free to uh, jump in here. Kierkegaard, as he looked at life, saw different levels of being human. There was the the aesthetic level, where you, you live life after beauty and style, we would say. And there was the moral level, where you live in terms of a code of right and wrong. Uh, and as he looked at religion, he thought most people who were religious, were religious. They, they lived in terms of set moral codes that could be reduced to rational equations. Put in, the, uh, see this need, put in this act of obedience, get this result of blessing or whatever. And it, it all could be brought down to that. And, and so he characterized the pagan religions where you bargained with the gods. Come to that in a second. But in Abraham, he sees someone who transcends the laws of right and wrong. He lives beyond that. He lives by a faith that is is truly a leap of faith. It has no connection with with rationality. And yet it is the most magnificent way to live, irrationally. I think as Emily pointed out, at least to us last week, if not to our audience, Kierkegaard brings in uh, Agamemnon's daughter, right? Iphigenia, yes. <laughs> yeah, you, and you, you know the story. Um, Agamemnon's offended, who is it, Diana, Artemis, and she will not give a fair wind, and in the end, he's told by an oracle, well, the only way you can do this, you can get her goodwill, is to offer up a sacrifice, specifically your daughter. And he calculates, and he realizes, well, let's see, there's fulfilling my oath to protect Helen, there's the plunder I'm going to get out of Troy. There's all the uh, excitement and agitation that I don't want to be the victim of if I tell them they can't go. You know, there's a lot of things going here that, that just says we need to go to Troy. And um, then there's my daughter whom I love. Now you can always get another daughter. <clears throat> and so he invites her to come, telling her that she will be the bride of Achilles, which is an incredible honor for any young woman, apparently unless you actually know Achilles and his life. Anyway, that's something else. <laughs> so she comes ready to get married, but realizes too late that, that things are not what they seem. Talks to dad. and Dad has to admit, yeah, I brought you here to kill you because of this and this. And she herself reasons through and says, so you're saying that if I step onto the altar and I'm killed, then all of our Greek fleet will get to go and smash these Trojans to pieces and no Trojan will ever come and steal Greek women again. Yeah, honey, that's about it. Okay, that's worth it. Kill me. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> but it's, you know, Welcome it's... to Greek. <laughs> oh, I've, I've already been introduced. It's just every, every day is a new horror. It never gets better, does it? <laughs> no, it never does. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the later playwrights, I don't remember who, we wrote the myth to say, no, uh, that wasn't what Artemis wanted at all. She was shocked by the whole thing. And so she swooped in and and switched Iphigenia for a mannequin-like thing that they actually killed in her place and took 
Iphigenia over to their side of the black sea and made her a priestess someplace. Because even the Greeks had trouble with this one. <laughs> it's like they, even that change. It's like these are warriors. They know what a stabbing a person is like. <laughs> Like, the thing ah, is, they use this... ballistic gel to oh, make that's what it was. So Yes, that's right. It felt very lifelike. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And so the guys have experience with that. And yeah, the point being, Kierkegaard got that. You're bargaining with the gods. You want X. X is more valuable than Y. They're asking for Y. You give up Y to get X. Straightforward. Maybe we do. Maybe we don't like it. Maybe it does or doesn't conform to our personal morality. But at least it's understandable. Yeah, Agamemnon's out to get something that's very valuable to him, and he's willing to make the trade. Free market economics and all that. <laughs> but then he says, I look at Abram, and I, I, I don't get it. The man astounds me. He, just to maintain this, this relationship with God, whatever the word relationship means here, he was willing to give up everything, give up the promises, give up the future of the world. And yet somehow God was sneaking, gave it all back. And that doesn't quite seem fair, but you know, if that's how unfairness worked, can I have some place? <laughs> uh, maybe I'll get Regina back on the other side. So that's, that's the root of, of existentialism as we know it moving on into the 20th century, that there are things beyond logic, beyond reason, beyond calculation, and that religion is chief of them. Or if we don't want religion, as most of the existentialist philosophers didn't, then we replace it with something else, some final experience, uh, existential angst, something that presents to us some kind of what we call meaning, but it's a meaning that involves no kind of verbal definition. We cannot say, oh, the world means this and why am i seeing the number 42 in my head right now you know the answer to life the universe and everything 42. well you never asked what the question <laughs> you never gave us the question <laughs> yeah they're going to kill us aren't they yeah most likely well and it, 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 it's it, it's like this conception of of god and his his action in history has clearly been affected by this especially in the in the mainstream view even in the mainstream evangelical view where basically mm -hmm. if god if you get a feeling that God is telling you to do something, then you should accept that because God doesn't adhere to the rules of logic. Right. And certainly he can go back on his own word because he's God. He's ineffable. He can do whatever he wants and whatever he wants because he's the one doing it is good instead of recognizing the fact that, you know, he he's self-consistent. And when he says something is good, it it is good. Yeah. Because he said it is, and he won't go back on that. Yeah, Kierkegaard's view is also really individualistic, in that mm -hmm. you know you see Agamemnon representing the tragic hero who's relatable because he's making these calculations in terms of this ethical framework, whereas Abraham's essence as the knight of faith is that he has this individual experience to the universal, some sort of mm -hmm. thing going on that transcends this, even this duty to not kill your son, which seems pretty basic. But <laughs> to me, it was just such a contrast with what we talked about last week is that, you know, Christians just kind of, we want to go about life and take care mm -hmm. of the people that are entrusted to us and take care of the things that are entrusted to us um, in contrast to this ineffable experience by virtue of the absurd we have to do these things that don't make sense and don't even conform to what we think god has told us to what we know god has told us in the bible and when you start talking about the bible well, uh, and even worse the creeds or confessions then you're labeled some kind of legalist or creedalist i got tagged with that one in school because you're trying to force god into a box as if God's <laughs> self-consistency were some kind of prison for God that doesn't allow him to be whatever at whenever. Again, too great to be contained in any one religion, any one confession, creed, or even in the Bible itself. Mm. And isn't there an irony there, too, in that people who don't want to put God in the box of being self-consistent also claim, well, I have to do this because it's who I am. 
Yes. Do you want me to deny myself? Yes, you're actually, you're actually supposed to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus. Yeah, the only one who's not supposed to deny himself is, you know, God. God. <laughs> because his desires are eternally and um, consistently perfect. Yeah, so he cannot deny himself, we're told. In his divinity, anyway. Yes. So <laughs> there we go. There's the there's the story. But of course, there's more. Kierkegaard willfully overlooks what Abraham says. He uh, has two young men servants with him, and says to them, "Abide you here with the ass. I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you." And a, a lot of. Um, Critics and, and enemies of the Bible have just blown over that and said, well, obviously Abram was lying because if he told them the truth, these young men might try to uh, sacrifice Isaac or Isaac, I mean, the rescue Isaac. And even at this point, Isaac himself might have said, wait, what? <laughs> so it was, it, was a, it was a religious lie, a necessary lie, a useful lie, a good lie in order to pull off what, what God had told him. The writer of Hebrews, of course, takes a very different tact on this. Of course, if you don't believe that the writer of Hebrews was inspired, then maybe it doesn't help a whole lot. But then why are you listening to us? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Also true. Also true. Um, by faith, this is chapter 11, verse 17, Abram, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Uh, the writer here lays it on pretty heavily. This father offered up his only begotten son. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, <laughs> wink, wink. Just, wait, wait, wait. No, he had other sons. Yes, technically, biologically speaking, you could say that Isaac was the second born son. But in covenant reckoning and in terms of the lawful marriage that Abram had entered into before the thing with Hagar, Isaac was the son, the son of the promise, and in that sense, the only begotten son, and as such becomes a figure of Jesus. And so he dies and he comes back, but unlike Jesus, Isaac comes back in a figure. I mean, in a sense, he came from Abraham originally in a figure. Abram's body, we're told, was dead. So was Sarah's womb. And yet out of that death, God had brought life. And Abraham, by this point, did have the faith to realize, wait, I got him by a miracle from death into life. God has told me that he is the hope of the world, that through him, the seed, the Messiah is going to come. So if he, he seems to be telling me I actually am going to have to kill him, if that's what he wants, then in order to be faithful to his promise, he will have to raise him from the dead. And after a figure, that's what happens because of the, the ram whose horns are caught in the thicket gets sacrificed in Isaac's place and Isaac comes back alive, although having been presented to God as a whole burnt offering. And that's what the text actually says here. Something relevant later on for the story of um, Jephthah and his daughter. Uh, he offered up Isaac. He that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. He did do what God had said and would have completed the act to the end had God allowed him. But God, of course, intervenes. The angel of the Lord speaks and says, stop it. Wait. Yes. Wait. What? Yes. God. Yes. Listen. This is the faith of Abraham. And this is exactly what Kierkegaard was not looking for. Kierkegaard, the last thing Kierkegaard wants is, is us trying to figure God out to perform calculations on the divine promises. But that's what God, that's what Abraham did. God said this, he commanded this, the obvious solution, and promise plus this command equals resurrection. Now I'm sure Abraham still was not thrilled about the idea of running a knife through his son, but he knew that whatever he did would not be permanent. That God had said this, and that God would keep his promise, and that God, although we cannot bind God by magic, God can bind himself by his own word, by his own promises and oaths to us. And it is appropriate that this, which is a picture of the death and resurrection of Christ, God's only begotten Son, should be the place where God really draws attention to this. God will keep his promise, 
however strange and unimaginable it might be as to how in the world he's going to do that. So faith is then not a leap, as Kierkegaard would describe it. No, faith is not a leap. And this is where I, I tell Francis Schaeffer's story because it's such a good one. And it appears, I think, mm -hmm. a couple of times in his, in his book. It's in um, the tail end of uh, He is There and He's Not Silent, I know. It may be elsewhere. Uh, Francis Schaeffer ministered in the Alps to the up and out children of the uh, the rich and wealthy in the, in the 60s. And so this is a story that involves the Alps and to demonstrate the difference between faith and faith, Kierkegaard's faith versus biblical faith. It's not a, a perfect example, but it's not bad. He says, you know, if you're wandering through the Alps, sometimes storms come up really fast and the snow just gets dumped and everything gets whitewashed and there's no way out. So imagine that this is, this is what's happening. You're up there and suddenly the storm comes and the, you're, you know you can't get out of this. Now you think, but wait, I'm up here high. I'm along this little, this little um, path along the side of the cliff. What if over there at the end of this, what I see that the path is, what if I were to jump? And what if there were a big, nice, fluffy snow pile at the bottom? And I jumped and I landed there and I would be down out of the ice cold winds, wind chill factor, make myself a little snow cave. And then in the morning, maybe I could crawl out and survive because I don't have any other options. Otherwise, I am, I am dead. And so this man, hoping in hope, makes most literally a leap of faith. He's got no reason to think this thing is so. And yet on the basis of it has to be or I'm dead, he leaps. That's for, for Schaefer. That's Kierkegaard's version of faith. So now consider another option. You're up there. And again, the wind, the wind and the snow comes. And you realize that you're going to be dead. And then out of the mist and the snow, you hear a voice that says something to the effect, well, you can't see me from where you are, but I can see you. Here's my name. You may recognize it. I have lived in these mountains, boy and man, now for, you know, 50 years. I know these, these passes like the back of my hand. And I know that just beyond where you are, there is this little cleft in the rock and you can jump off. And right below, there's always this pile, this huge pile of snow. If you jump and land there, you will be safe until morning. And in the morning, I will come and rescue you and dig you out. And as you talk to this man, you, you recognize that he knows your world. He knows your little villages, your little village. He knows the names of people you know. He in, indeed seems to be an expert on all of this. In fact, you even you even realize now that you've heard of this man, he has a reputation for honesty and, and for knowing, knowing the mountains. And so now on the basis of testimony, propositional verbal testimony from an expert of good character, you jump and you fall. Now, there's, this is not the complete answer, and Van Til, I think, would take it further, but at least it's a start. Uh, the difference here between faith and faith is in the one case, you got nothing and you jump because you got nothing. In the other case, you have revelation from someone outside of you who is an expert, who is someone of good character, someone you have every reason to trust, and he has told you in his expertise, what you need to do to be saved. Mm. These are, and now you are not trusting a hope, you're trusting a person, mm -hmm. a person who has good credentials. Exactly. I actually, in complementarity to that, I went over to grab my copy of the Westminster Confession mm. and chapter 14 of Saving Faith, paragraph 2. By this faith, a Christian believeth to be true whatsoever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself speaking therein and acteth differently upon that which each particular passage thereof containeth, yielding obedience to the commands, trembling at the threatenings and embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. But the principal acts of saving faith are accepting receiving, and resting upon Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. Again, like you were saying, this is revelation come from outside of us and focused on the individual person of Christ the Lord. Yes. And I think what, what Schaefer misses here and what Dr. Van Til would contribute to this would be that 
the voice we hear is not the voice of a stranger. It's the voice of our father mm. or the voice of our creator. It is not a strange voice of a stranger who we maybe heard something about once upon a time. It's the person in whose image we are and whose voice and nature we cannot escape. So, Brian, uh, you have the Westminster Confession. Would you read the section on uh, at the beginning about the Word of God and its authority, how we know it to be the Word of God? Of course. Uh, that's chapter 1, paragraph 4. The authority of the Holy Scripture, for which it ought to be believed and obeyed, dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. And therefore it is to be received, because it is the Word of God. It is to be received because it's the word of God. And and the would be autonomous man yells, but how do you how do you know that? I want proof. Well, the proof lies within yourself. You're in rebellion against this God. This is the God you happen to hate. And so he is no stranger to you. This mm -hmm. is not someone you have just heard of for the first time from afar. This is your creator. And 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 so it's that God. Uh, one of the questions, or one of, one of the, I don't know if it comes to that as a question, but when I'm talking to my students, uh, and I asked, I guess I asked them about what's what's the content of general revelation, what what does it tell us, and they will generally say, well, it tells us there's a God, <laughs> and I will slap their hands regularly and say, no, not a God. You know, sometimes we say it just because we're sloppy or don't want to use all the extra words to get the point across, but I think we need to be careful here. Not just a God, the God. The Trinitarian God, the Creator God, the God in whose image we exist, the God who we've offended, the God we're at war with, that God, the God we don't, whose existence I don't need to prove to you because you already hate him really good. As I've said many times, the problem is not that people need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They already got a personal relationship. They personally hate him uh, until they until the Holy Spirit brings them to repentance through the gospel. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we're, we're not trying to convince anybody of anything they don't already know very, very well. But we're trying to get them to admit it as a sort of, what is it, uh, spiritual ther therapeuticness. Get, <laughs> get, get, them, get them to, spiritual therapy, I guess, get them to confess their own rebellion against God and the fact that they have no reason to rebel against this God that they hate. Because it's hard to talk about the good news if they don't admit the bad news. Yeah, it's only once they know that that they can look to him in trust for salvation of as one who's going to have mercy upon them by his own promise in Absolutely. accordance with his own word. Mm -hmm. And contra certain modern theologians and uh, apologists, we're not arguing for just a, a bare gen generic theism. Yeah, like when we look to general revelation specifically, it it the the very content of nature and of of creation screams Jehovah yeah. specifically. It 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 doesn't work with any other deity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a God out there. I'm not sure if it's Odin, Zeus, Ra, or Jehovah, but I think <laughs> I'm on the right track here. No, you're not. Actually, if you've got that far, you haven't got anywhere. It's the Bible is very clear that see if that were true, then men wouldn't be sinners. And by showing them that God exists, we awaken them to the possibility of now being rebels against the God they previously didn't know a thing about. So, so the safest actually, thing to do is not to evangelize anyone. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> There's an old quote, uh, like an exchange. I, it's probably apocryphal, but it's a it's a <laughs> quote. That, it's a quoted exchange between a Roman Catholic missionary and someone from one of the northern. Inuit tribes, I think, mm -hmm. and basically he, he's he you know he tells this this uh, native about God and what he must do to believe and be saved, and he says you know he he listens to the argument and he he responds back to the the missionary saying, so if you had not told me about this God, I would stand under no condemnation. And the, the Roman Catholic missionary goes, that's correct. And the guy goes, why did you tell me then? <laughs> If, if that's if it's that's a valid question, <laughs> it's a very valid Absolutely. question. If the whole purpose of missionary work isn't to to just tell them, hey, you're already in rebellion yeah. against the God you know, mm -hmm. if it's instead saying, there's this God you have no idea about, and now that you know about him, 
if you reject him, you're going to go to hell. There's no purpose in evangelizing. We should get, we should stop evangelizing and not <laughs> let people know about this because then they have better chances of getting into heaven. They can find a book by it by accident and ruin it for themselves, but we shouldn't be the ones <laughs> to tell them. <laughs> side issue lead, leads to side issue. When uh, Charles Finney was asked about the salvation of, of young children, in his mind, they were not moral agents because they did not have the rational ability to to understand how the universe works or to understand their own nature. And so when he was asked, he said, well, I suppose they go to heaven because, I mean, not like they're worth much, but they're not moral agents. So if they go someplace, I guess they would have to go to heaven. But who needs to worry about that? It was what? not really encouraging. But of course, this is the same man who taught us that human choice is the most important thing in religious experience. Mm. Uh, the sins of the church get reflected back into the world. When the church decides that man's free will choice is the most important thing and that children aren't really human beings, are we really surprised that about 100 years later, the world is using similar arguments to justify abortion? The child isn't really human. Uh, the woman who is human, her choice is the most important thing for her. And so that's easy. And how many um, how many Bible teachers, pastors, theologians have basically argued that until children reach some hypothetical age of accountability, they they can't go to hell. So apparently God saves them, although there's no clear text to say such. And in spite of the fact that God says they're conceived and born in sin, mm. there's a lot of um, shifting around of uh, cups here to keep us from looking at what the theology that's actually going on. This and to excuse of... us from yeah. discipling children and preaching the yeah. gospel to all nations. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And there's this, this assumption, really, although they, they don't say it, I've never heard it. But it, it comes out. So what you're saying is this child has no relationship to God. He's not a saint, but he's not a sinner. So he has a non-existent relationship with God. In other words, he's not human. He's not the image of God. So these are scary things and way off the tangent from where we started. Yeah. But, you know, this is you... not a pleasant tangent. Let's come back. <laughs> right, let's come let's back. Let's go back to the, the angst of existential <laughs> It has That's to be happier. pronounced that way. Yeah, when 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 uh, existentialism looks good. But I'd like to throw in a point, actually, good. to sort of not just in the direction of Van Til. One of the lasting impacts that Kierkegaard has had on culture is seeing faith as a leap or mm -hmm. something that picks up where rationality leaves off. Um, I think that's very pervasive in evangelicalism, that reason can get you so far yeah. and then there has to be faith. Whereas I don't think that's really a framework that fits with the Bible and fits even no. with how we work. Like we are rational creatures just as we are physical creatures. Like we have minds because that's yeah. the way God made us. We have bodies and both of these things are fallen. Our rationality doesn't work the way it should just as our bodies get sick and decay right. and die. And so it's faith in Jesus the gift of God that is this faith in Jesus that regenerates and redeems. And yet we, we have these fallen natures, both body and soul and mind, that all of us is affected by the fall in toto. Yes. Uh, while you were talking, something else did come to mind. And maybe this can be our, our wrap up of tie off. I was uh, teaching systematics and there was one young man whose name you might remember if I mentioned it, I'm not sure. But he was sitting a few rows back and he, he was obviously having trouble with what we were talking about, whatever it was. And I, I called him and he said, look, I, I, I'm just really having trouble with all this. I mean, you're, we're talking about God. How do we know that God exists? And I said, well, what, what exactly are you looking for? We, we've been, I guess we must have been talking about presuppositional approach to apologetics or something like that because because he was clearly not happy with, with where we were. Um, he said, I, I, I'm not sure. I just, I just want, I want absolute assurance that God is. And I said, wait, are you saying you want to be 
inside the universe and outside the universe in all places at all times so that you can have immediate and exact knowledge of what reality is. He said, yes, that's it. <laughs> Good luck. You're not getting it. <laughs> um, but that's that's the nature of of humanism, which is both rationalistic mm -hmm. and irrationalistic. We all know we can't have that. What exactly are they asking for when they want proof? They, they want knowledge are the, in the way that God has knowledge. <laughs> yes, they want to be God. Yeah. Um, they, they are the image of God. They act as if God is. They know as if God is there to guarantee knowledge. They, they act in terms of a sense of responsibility, which only rationally falls out of, of divine order. And yet that's not enough. There's got to be something more. There's got to be something where God stoops to their level and as it were, makes a personal appearance on you know their uh, Google channel at such and such a time <laughs> and shakes their hand. They know they're not going to get that. And so they keep complaining that God has not given them enough evidence. And some of the great atheists of the last century when asked, what, what will you say, sir, if you, if you die and go to heaven and there is a God? Well, I will respectfully tell him that he did not give me enough evidence. And God will say, <laughs> no. <laughs> the problem here is that you hated me and you knew that. Yeah. If they will not believe Moses and the prophets, they will not believe even should a man rise from the dead. Even though a man should rise from the dead. This sounds like a good place to break it off and go to recommendations. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Would you like to go first? Yeah, I'm going to recommend, uh, with, with reservations, uh, Francis Schaeffer's trilogy, the God, and it's supposed to be read in this order, apparently, the God who is there escaped from reason, and he is there, and he is not silent. Now, there is a rationalistic streak in Schaeffer's writing. I know that. You don't have to write and tell me. <laughs> but unfortunately, he has brought some of these ideas down to a level where someone with a moderately good education can follow along much better than some of other writers. Dr. Van Til, for all his brilliance, is brilliant, but sometimes really hard to follow. Um, mm -hmm. We could recommend here his little class syllabus called Simply Apologetics, where he summarizes Defense of the Faith and some of his other things real, real quick. But uh, Dr. Schaefer ties some of these ideas in to um, the history of Europe and, and of the 20th century, giving us examples in general culture, the arts, music, philosophy, literature, and so on. And whereas we have to remember that it's, we're, we're, not, we're not to argue that Christianity makes more sense than any other worldview, we at least can recognize these things called worldviews and these things called presuppositions, and we can begin to see how they have manifested themselves in, in Western culture and begin to get a working vocabulary. So if you haven't read the trilogy, it's worth your time as a starting place. Just understand that there is more to refining your thought um, biblically and theologically. Mm. I'll go next, I guess. I have another one to recommend with a lot heavier of uh, reservation <laughs> uh, because it is uh, Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology, oh. which is a phenomenal co uh, condensation, condensing, I don't know what the proper noun is in this particular instance, of uh, the Norse myths. I believe in his prologue, he specifically says, I'm not trying to give you the most accurate version because... There's at least a dozen versions, and these were originally uh, spoken stories shared around campfires by, by bards and eventually written down later by Christian monks after <laughs> uh, most of the original adherents of the religion had converted over to Christianity. So these are not the original versions. You should not take them as such. You should take liberties if you tell them again. But these are what I wrote down, and they're fun. Because <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of the entire point of myths and retelling them right it's to change yes. them and make them more engaging along the way exactly yeah true bardic folklore bardic inspiration Indeed. plus four. Oh dear um. <laughs> but the awen came on me and <laughs> well, some right. people have no idea what you're talking about anyway, <laughs> anyway I, I can second that recommendation we listened to the audiobook which is read by the author oh um, that's right available on audible oh. yeah so that's great um, my recommendation is going to be another podcast to listen to. Um, this is called Popcorn Parenting. Um, <laughs> it is 
British sitcom writer James Carey, who runs apparently a lot of podcasts, all of which are phenomenal. But he co-hosts with Nate Morgan Locke, who's on faculty at Westminster Seminary, Philadelphia. Oh. And they talk about kids' movies and mm -hmm. enjoying them with your kids, enjoying them as art, letting the art speak, and the conversations that you can have with your kids to disciple them. Obviously, not through the movies, because you disciple your kids through reading the Bible and <laughs> things like that. But, uh, but some of the ways to enjoy movies with your kids as a Christian parent. Um, and I don't have kids yet, but I like all of the movies that they're talking about. So <laughs> I can totally recommend their podcast. And we'll have links to all of these records in the show notes. Nice. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thanks to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our supporters for helping to keep us on the internet. Uh, don't forget to check out those show notes if you want to find out more about something we mentioned on the show. And if you're enjoying our little podcast here, share it with someone you know, either in person or on social media. Thanks so much for listening. Hope to see you next week.